Well, welcome again. I am thrilled to be here. I, I haven't been in this little church for a while, and it's, it's done my soul good. I, I was thinking as I was coming up, I guess it's Route 87, the way maybe, and going around the roundabouts. Um, everything was becoming a little more familiar, and uh, I liked that a lot. And I, I really enjoyed getting to see some of you that I haven't seen for a while. And some of those that I've never seen before, I appreciate getting to expand my uh, list of brothers and sisters. So thank you so much. I really mean that. I, I'm so glad that I can be here. And um, if you don't want to stone me when I leave, and if you ever like for me to come back, I, I'd love to be reinvited out. But in, the, in between time, I just want to say what we say in West Virginia, and that is that we'd like for you all to come see us. Uh, you all come, and we'd be glad for any of you to come. Uh, I've got a big house. I can put up people. Just bring a crew of you, and I'll, we'll treat you right in West Virginia, I, pray, I promise you. Uh, we are good, good in hospitality there. We've been talking about the ceiling, the ceiling, and how vital it is that we are sealed with the seal of the living God. Now, there's something I call the neglected part of the ceiling, and this is a, an area that we don't hear really discussed very much. But I mentioned to you a chapter in the Testimonies on the Seal of God, Volume 5, starting around page 207. I encourage you to read that. But there's also um, a little treatise here in Ezekiel chapter 9 that we need to look at. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 9. And I mentioned, I, 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 went, I was so bold to mention a statement earlier that really our, our understanding and receiving the seal of God will affect our eternal destiny. And I think that this will be very well played out here as we see this. Uh, and I do have some of it on the screen for you also as well, for those who can see the screen. We're going to start reading in Ezekiel chapter 9. In verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Calls them to have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man his slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. See the picture of Ezekiel. There are six men who are, who are angels. We'll, we'll understand this later. With slaughter weapons and another clothed with linen with the writer's inkhorn by his side. They went and they stood beside the brazen altar. Now where was the brazen altar located? In the courtyard. In the courtyard. Verse 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst, of, in the midst thereof. Now, earlier in our prior session, we saw a statement that said that those who are not concerned about their own spiritual condition nor mourn over the condition of others, will not receive the seal of God. Do you remember that statement? And I emphasize that word nor, and I would say it's this and this. And here it says that there's a mark set upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations to be done in the midst thereof. So there's some kind of a mark that goes in the forehead. Where was the seal of God going to be placed? In the foreheads. Now, this word mark is the Hebrew uh, letter tav, it's an unusual word, but it's a mark. It's a signature mark. And I'm going to read to you just something here. Sorry, I didn't advance that slide for you earlier. This is from Gospel Workers, page 444.3. And she's speaking about this picture that you've just read. And she says, The mightiest of angels has in his hand the seal of the living God, or of him who alone can give life, who can inscribe upon the foreheads the mark or inscription to whom shall be granted immortality, eternal life. So this mark that this angel places upon the forehead, in one place we read, you know, it's, it's no visible mark people can see, but it's a selling in the truth, both 
uh, intellectually and spiritually, such that we cannot be moved. And this is done by this particular individual. He's called the, the, the one clothed in linen with the writer's inkhorn by his side. And Ellen White calls him the mightiest of angels. In early writings on, oops, there we go, 279.2, I saw angels hurrying to and fro. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done. And the saints were numbered and sealed. I'll just pause there for a second. Is this speaking about the same thing we've just read about in Ezekiel 9? It, it unmistakably is, isn't it? His work was done. In fact, we'll read a, a verse in just a little bit where he says, I have done as thou hast commanded me. It says, the saints were numbered and sealed. So the saints were sealed. So this mark is numbering and sealing the saints. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark, containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. It's done. This sealing work, this work for humanity is now done. Those who are saved are sealed and those who aren't are lost forever. And all the angelic hosts laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And again, it's early writings, page 279.2. Notice that this mark is only, according to our text, it's only for those who sigh and cry over certain abominations. And we're going to find out later that these abominations are things in the professed church. Now, if you only get the seal of God if you sigh and cry over the abominations, it should be important to know what those abominations are. How could you sigh and cry over them if you didn't know what they are? Is that reasonable? Is that logical? I think so. But let's go ahead and read a little bit more in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. So he's given his commission to the writer, uh, the, the man who had the writer's inkhorn, clothed in linen. And he's, one, he's done his sealing work. And to the others, he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Commenting upon these verses. Again, in that Seal of God chapter, in Volume 5 of the Testimonies, this is on page 211, paragraph 2, and I've broken the paragraph into two different slides so it's big enough to see. She says this, referring to these texts, especially verse 6, she says, Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to fill the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people had betrayed their trust. They had betrayed their trust. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles in the marked manifestation of God's power as in former days. Times have changed, they say. These words strengthen their unbelief. And they say, what do they say? The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Why, this is God's church. It's going through. It doesn't matter what happens. Thus, peace and safety is the cry for men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. And if we stop right there, well, they were rebels. They were betrayers. They committed treason against God. They're going to be cut down. And they deserve it. But you know, neither the text nor the testimony finishes there. It says men, maidens, and little children even all perish together. Is that psalm to think about? To think about the fact that 
being involved in this apostasy, being involved in these abominations, has so contaminated even the maidens and little children that they cannot be saved now. They will be lost eternally. Men, maidens, and little children all perish together. Continuing in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them. And I was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue or remnant of Israel? in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem. When Ezekiel sees the scene, it looks like there's not going to be anyone left. It seems like none of even the remnant will be left. In volume 5, page 50, paragraph 2, it says, Many hear the invitation of mercy, are tested and proved, but few are sealed with the seal of the living God. Few are sealed with the seal of the living God. Few will humble themselves as a little child that they may enter the kingdom of heaven. Continuing in Ezekiel, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10 now. Then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their heads. God communicates to humanity through Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? When Ezekiel hears this, he's hearing the message of the Father through Christ because they are one. And they teach the same thing. You know, there's this idea. I saw a sign on a store one time. and says, God condemns, but Jesus saves. God condemns, but Jesus saves. And it's setting the Father and Son at odds with each other, but the Father and Son are one. They, they, they agree on all the things they do. And so when it says here, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. This is the attitude of Christ as well, the merciful, meek Jesus Christ. He says, my eye will not spare. I won't have pity. It's so bad. They have to be destroyed. This is expressing a wrath from God that has no mercy. And before... Um, God has shown mercy and wrath in all that he's done. God's always shown some mercy in his wrath, but not now. In Revelation 14, right in the three angels' messages, in verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. When it says without mixture, what does that mean? Undiluted. Undiluted. Full strength. You know, back in those evil college days when I was in that Greek fraternity I told you about last time, you know, we would take a trash can and we'd pour a few cases of pure grain alcohol in it. And then we would pour in some water and mix a couple jars of grape tang in it and uh, take a boat oar and stir it up, you know, and dilute the pure grain alcohol down some at least. This is, this is terrible, friends. We don't begin to understand what the wrath of God means. Well, commenting upon this in early writings, page 71.1, I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus partially. Oh, it didn't say partially? It said fully, didn't it? Yes, fully. That's what it means. That's exactly what it means. I was in the uh, Andrews University Seminary Chapel a few years back. And there was a person preaching whose name, if I mentioned it, I'm sure you'd recognize it. And uh, he made a statement, and he said this. He said, I'm so glad Jesus will be mediating for us right to the time he comes. And in the background, you hear these amens. Yeah, yeah, great, good, good. Do you understand what that means when he said that? He's, he was saying, in effect, that we will not have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator right to the very moment Jesus comes. In other words, don't worry about perfection of character. Don't worry about overcoming all sin. That's what he was saying. But it directly contradicts what the testimony says. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I'll take the testimony. I'll always take the testimony. In Ezekiel 9 and verse 11 now, And I beheld the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. 
He did the work that God gave him to do. And not only did he do the work, but those men with the slaughtering weapons, they did their work also. Now it's very clear from what has happened in Ezekiel chapter 9 that this is a result of judgment. There are two classes. One is cut down by the men with slaughtering weapons, and the others receive the seal of the living God. And they receive it in their foreheads. And this mark is given to one group, one group and one group only. They are the ones who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in the land. In Revelation, it speaks about them being the 144,000. It speaks about them having no guile in their mouths. As it speaks about them receiving the seal of the Father and His Father's name written in their foreheads as being redeemed from the earth as virgins without guile and without fault before the throne of God. Now, to understand, though, what is happening in Ezekiel 9, we have to have some background to understand what these abominations are. And in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 8, God reveals to Ezekiel the abominations that were occurring in what he calls Jerusalem. Chapters 8 and 9 of Ezekiel make up a part of what I will call an enacted prophecy. An enacted prophecy. In other words, if you remember, you remember Ezekiel, where is Ezekiel writing from? What country is Ezekiel in at this time? Babylon. No, Ezekiel was taken in captivity. He was in Babylon. He says, I was by the river Chebar. He, he, he was in the land of Shinar and the Chaldeans. And Jeremiah, you know, was the prophet left in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was the great prophet taken out. And so there were, there were things happening in Jerusalem, of course, and Jeremiah spoke against a lot of the, you know, things happening in Jerusalem. But Ezekiel was specifically given visions of things that were happening at that time in Jerusalem, but these were symbolic, or they were acting out prophetically what was going to happen in God's church at the end of time. That's what was happening. This is a prophecy about what's happening in the end of time. And there's too many clues to tell us anything else. This end time setting is impossible to miss. The servant of the Lord is plainly stated concerning this prophecy. And here's an example from the Seal of God chapter again. The prophet looking down the ages, and she's speaking here about Ezekiel 9. The prophet looking down the ages had this time presented before his vision. So he's seeing things in Jerusalem that represent things that happen in our time, in the last time. Another statement. Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat of the heavenly sanctuary. Now she's not just saying that in general. She's saying it in relationship to this prophecy. This prophecy teaches us that. And so it's an end time event prophecy. She says also in volume 3 on page 266, she says, especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is, this is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the man, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. Is there any question at all that she's speaking about Ezekiel 9 here? You don't find this, this scenario of, of, of a man clothed in linen with a rider's ink horn and these other men with slaughtering weapons anywhere else in the scriptures, anywhere. She has to be speaking about Ezekiel 9. There's just nothing else that she can be speaking about. And it says, in the last days, the only people who will be sealed are those who sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, in some statements in the scriptures, represents Jerusalem. It's just the city, speaking about the city. But sometimes Jerusalem represents God's people. It does sometimes. Okay? Here's an example of, of, of a statement that substantiates that. In volume 3, 267.1, mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sign cry for all the abominations that be done in the church. In the text it says in Jerusalem. Here she says in the church. So Jerusalem was symbolic of the church. Now, Ezekiel lists, in Ezekiel chapter 8, it lists four abominations. We'll see this in a little bit. And the Hebrew word for abomination is called tuabah. Tuabah. And this word means something that is disgusting, something that is abominable. And I'll, I'll show you some references to that in a little bit. But just to give you an overview first, there's four uh, abominations. The first one is called the image of jealousy. The image of jealousy. The next abomination shows Ezekiel 
Um, he, he sees what are called creeping things and abominable beasts on all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. He sees a third abomination where women are weeping for Tammuz. And then finally he sees 25 men with their backs to the temple and facing east toward the sun, worshiping the sun. And call, God calls all of these things abominations. And this Hebrew word, tuaba, again, it means something disgusting, something loathful. I'm just going to give you some references. I won't take time to read all the text, but I'll give you the references if you want them. And again, like I said last night, if anybody wants an electronic copy of my notes, I'll be glad to, to, to put them in some format that you can use. PDF, Word format, whatever, RTF. Homosexuality and other sexual perversions in Leviticus 18, 22 through 26 are called abominations. They're called tuaba. So people say, you know, well, God made me this way. God didn't make anyone that way. If people say, well, God's okay with me like this, God says it's an abomination. It's something loathsome to me. It's something disgusting to me. That's what he says about these sexual deviant ideas. Idolatry, Deuteronomy 7.25, is a tuaba to God. Human sacrifice, Deuteronomy 12.31, is a tuaba to God. Occult activities, Deuteronomy 18.4 or 9 through 14, are all listed as abominations using this Hebrew word, tuaba. So I'm just giving you those backgrounds so you can understand when God says, this is an abomination to me, it helps you understand that God views this as something loathsome, something really, really bad. Really bad. Solomon lists seven abominations in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. And by the context of the usages of tuabah, again, we see that it is something that is described by the word um, that does not in any way please God, but rather something that's very abhorring to God. Something that is foul, repulsive, nauseating, disgusting. And by calling the four things that we're going to be looking at in Ezekiel abominations, God is making his attitude well known concerning them. And if we don't have concern about them, here are disgusting, horrible things happen in church, and if we're not concerned about them, we're not going to get to sell God. That's what the text says. I'm not, I don't think I'm being unfair with the text. So let's go back to Ezekiel 8. Let's go back to Ezekiel 8. And, I, and um, I'm going to start in verse, well, I mentioned these, okay. We're going to talk about this image of jealousy now, the first one, the image of jealousy. Ezekiel 8, verses 3 through 5. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. So Ezekiel sees something. He calls it an image of jealousy and it provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north. And behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So right here, among God's sanctuary, there is this pagan, heathen image of jealousy. Well, what is it? Why is it so bad? But it's called an image of jealousy. And that probably is something that we need to understand about. Because in six different times in the Bible, God declares that he is a jealous God. Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 34, 14. And Deuteronomy 4, 24. Deuteronomy 5, 9. 6, 15. And Joshua 24, 19. God says he's a jealous God. The first reference that I gave you is from the second commandment. And all the references, except for Joshua, directly deal with the issue of worshiping the true God instead of false gods. God did not wish for Israel to become trapped by the worship of false gods, and so he gave them some very specific instructions. And in Deuteronomy 32, we read some of these instructions. I'd like for you to read them with me. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy 32, verses 15 through 18. And again, if I read the text wrong, if I make a mistake, you correct me. You know, I might just make mistakes. I might even read it wrong just to see if you're listening. 
I don't want anyone to go sleep on me. Too, too, too sleep, right? I, you know, the, the, uh, the Baptist minister was, was preaching one day. And he, he looked at one of the deacons. He says, now if anyone goes to sleep, you come up and wake me up. <laughs> so, if anyone goes to sleep, one of you deacons come up and wake me up. Deuteronomy 32, verse 15. But Jerusalem waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. So there's strange gods, there's abominations. They provoked God to jealousy, keep all those terms in mind. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up of whom your fathers feared not, of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So he's given them warning. Don't get involved in this stuff. Continuing in verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred it. It was disgusting to him. It was loathsome to him. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith, and they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. You see, friends, God did not wish for Israel to become trapped by the worship of the false gods, and so he gave again very specific instructions to the people concerning the heathen. In Deuteronomy 7, in verse 5, Deuteronomy 7, in verse 5. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. Baal was said to be worshipped in the holy trees, and that's why they would have these groves, the, the groves, the prophets of the groves, prophets of Baal, prophets of the groves. They would take some of these trees, and they would cut off all the... Uh, branches from them and they would just have these upright poles and they worship them. they would have images some of them carved some of them made from stone and God said these things should be destroyed he didn't want them around his people in Deuteronomy chapter 12 in verse 3 it says and ye shall overthrow their altars this is what he wants them to do overthrow their altars break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place this is what God told his people to do. He said, destroy the pillars and the idols of the land that they were going to go into. No idol or image provoked God more to jealousy than sun pillars. Sun pillars. Anciently, as well as today, sun pillars provoked the God of heaven to jealousy. And God said to destroy these images and idols. And yet, interestingly, today, there's a lot of sun pillars still around. Did you know that? There are a lot of sun pillars around. Now, it should be noted where Ezekiel saw this abomination. He first noted that it was at the door of the inner gate, which looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. We read that in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 3. This image provoked God to jealousy, and the seat of the placement of the image was near the door of the inner gate toward the north. This was the location of the images of Baal, where they were usually kept at heathen temples. In fact, if you, if you do study in the archaeology of it, the history of it through archaeology, um, and we, they've, they've dug up some of these ancient uh, Canaanite temples where they worship Baal, you know? And they had a courtyard, they had a holy place, and they had a most holy place. Interesting, isn't it? The sun pillar which provoked God to jealousy was then more precisely located near the brazen altar close to the inner gate toward the north. Now, idols were a threat to the children of Israel and to the early church also, and these idols and images paved the way for further and deeper apostasy. Um, E.J. Wagoner, I noticed you've got a book out there by Wagoner and Jones, and some of you have heard of E.J. Wagoner, Dr. Wagoner. He was one of our ministers and uh, physicians in, in the uh, 19th century. And then, um, anyhow, uh, he wrote a book, and it was entitled Fathers of the Catholic Church. And maybe you haven't heard of that one. You've heard of a lot of his other books, maybe. But on page 268.1, he said this, The worship of images and the observance of the Sunday festival came to the church about the same time 
But images were regarded with reverence a long time before Sunday was regarded as a sacred day. Now that's important to know because it shows a timetable of how Satan works. Before he brought in Sunday, he brought in imagery. Isn't that interesting? And these idols. He did this before. These are the wiles of Satan. Um, in, in Ephesians uh, 6.11, uh, Paul there speaks about the wiles or the methodia. The Greek is methodia, the methods of Satan. You see, beloved, Satan brings in his images prior to the worship of himself and his day of worship. Not only were the images a snare for ancient Israel and the early church, but they can be a snare for us as well. As Ellen White said in Volume 5 of the Testimonies on page 116, paragraph 2, and if I'm going too, sla too, too, too fast, just, just do like this, slow down a little bit. Um, I knew this, this, this fellow, and his, he would speak. And his wife had these signals, like he, he had a, a voice that didn't always reach out well. And so she, she'd sort of tug on the ear, you know, speak up a little louder, you know. And when he spoke a little too long, she'd sort of go like this, you know. <laughs> uh, if you need to do that, you can, but, but slow me down if I'm too fast. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Um, my brain tends to, on some things, run slow and some things run fast, and I may run too fast on this, but Satan snares, his wiles, his methods, are laid for us just as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance in the land of Canaan. We're going to be just entering into the land of heavenly Canaan soon, right? So if he did this, this was his plan before and it worked for him then, we can expect him to repeat his plan. And says he's going to be repeating his plan. We are repeating the history of that people. So what were some of the main snares that Satan used to entangle Israel? They were idols and images. And then she says that we are repeating the history of that people. And notice again what God said about these idols and images concerning Israel. And this is in his, uh, Exodus 31. Verses 11 through 14. Exodus 31, 11 through 14. He says, Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. They weren't to make covenants with the people of the land who didn't worship the true God. Should our people have ever made covenants or agreements with the evangelicals? No. Absolutely never should have done that. Because it's become a snare to us. But ye shall destroy their altars. Here's what you are to do. You're to destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. For thou shalt not worship for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. And again, this jealous God is saying there's an image of jealousy. An image that brings me to great jealousy. And God says his name is Jealous, and he is a jealous God, and these idols provoke God to jealousy. Now, the Hebrew word for image in this uh, text is uh, matzavah, and it means an image or a pillar. Uh, most specifically, it's an obelisk. Do you know what an obelisk is? Mm -hmm. An obelisk is a four-sided pillar that has a pyramidal top to it. Uh, the largest obelisk in the world is the Washington Monument. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's, it's an obelisk. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But this, this Hebrew word, matzavah, its base meaning is something that is standing or erect. Something that is standing or erect. And the Hebrew word for grove is asherah. And asherah was supposed to be the consort of Baal in Canaanite worship. And God's command was to destroy their altars and break their images and cut down their groves. Now in Jeremiah chapter 43 and verse 13, it says, He shall break also the images of Beth Shemeth, that is in the land of Egypt, and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians shall he burn with fire. Now he mentions here Beth Shemesh. And this name means house of the sun. This name means house of the sun. In fact, if you take the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that was used by Christ and the apostles. Um, during, during the time of, of what we call this New Testament era, um, they didn't really use the Hebrew Bible much. The, the Greek was the common language of learning, and most people read Greek, and uh, they, they read from what's called the Septuagint. When Jesus got up in the synagogue to read from the scrolls, they were reading from the Septuagint. When Paul quotes in the Old Testament, he's most of the time quoting from the Septuagint. 
And interestingly, the Septuagint translates this as Heliopolis. Heliopolis, which is the city of the sun. Heliopolis was known for its sun pillars. But there was one immense pillar there that had become quite famous in their day and in our day as well. And it's been seen by persons, many people, and you've probably seen this obelisk, and if you've not seen it in person, you've probably seen a picture of it. You would know it if you saw it. And it's known as the obelisk of Heliopolis, and its current location is in the middle of St. Peter's Square at the Vatican. The history of the obelisk is intriguing. Let me just share a little bit of the history of it. Here's a picture of it. This is called the obelisk of Heliopolis. And you, you see here are people. So you get an idea of the immense size of this solid piece of granite. Can you imagine how hard it would be to move that? How hard it would be to put it up? Well, we have, we have some information on here. Here's another picture of it. Oh, this, this is interesting, and I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, this is, um, this is a, a series of quotations uh, from a book written by Ralph Waldo, and it's called Mystery Babylon Religion, pages 42 and 43. And I've got a few paragraphs to just give you the history behind it. But it says that the, uh, the Roman Emperor Caligula, in A.D. 37 through 41, had this obelisk transported from Heliopolis, Egypt, to his circus at the Vatican Hill, where now stands St. Peter's Cathedral. Now, Heliopolis, the city from which the obelisk was originally transported, is but the Greek name of Beth Shemesh, which was the center of Egyptian sun worship in olden days. And this was the very place of which we read in the Bible of the false worship that existed there, and in which special mention is made of the images or obelisk of Beth the house of the sun, making reference there to Jeremiah 43.13. And so... The very same obelisk that once stood at the ancient pagan temple at the center of Egyptian paganism, that was at Heliopolis or Beth Shemesh, now stands before the temple that is the center of modern paganism. The so-called Cathedral of St. Peter, the mother church of Catholicism. This seems more than a mere coincidence. He continues, the red granite obelisk of the Vatican is itself 83 feet high. It stands 132 feet high with its foundation and weighs 320 tons. In 1586, to make certain that this obelisk was centered right directly at the entry of the cathedral, it was moved a short distance to its present location, St. Peter's Square, by the order of Pope Sextus V. Of course, the moving of this heavy obelisk, especially in those days, was a very difficult task. Many movers refused to attempt the feat, especially when the Pope had attached the death penalty if the obelisk was broken, dropped and broken. Now, such a regulation itself indicated how much importance that the Pope and his people credited to this abominable idol. Now, what did God say that they should do with these kind of things? She should destroy them. She should break them down. Cast them down and break them. The Pope says, the vice chairman of Satan says, if you break it, you die. Interesting, isn't it? Well, finally, a man by the name of Domenico Fontana accepted the responsibility of the moving and erection of the Vatican obelisk. With 45 wenches, 160 horses, and a crew of 800 workmen, the task of moving began. The date, September 10, 1586. Multitudes crowded the extensive square. Upon the obelisk, while the obelisk was being moved, the crowd, upon penalty of death, was required to remain silent until the erection was made. Again, we see how much importance the Romish church attached to this idol. Finally, after near failure, the obelisk was erected to the sounds of hundreds of bells ringing, the roar of cannons, and the loud cheers of the multitude. The idol was dedicated to the cross. Mass was celebrated, and the Pope pronounced a blessing on the workmen and their horses. Um, and don't, I may have, uh, yes, here's some, uh, an artist's rendition of how they were trying to erect the, the obelisk. It's quite a, quite a feat, and, and history records this. This is just not made up stuff. This is, just, this is history, you can look it up. Now, we need to understand something, and I, I'm going to try to speak in a kind way about this and in a, um, a careful way, but an, obel an obelisk is simply a phallic symbol. An obelisk is a phallic symbol, and in order for these heathen symbols to carry out their representations, they had to be placed upright, pointing towards the sun. And God gave, God said that this representation should be taken down. 
But you know, Ellen White calls the Pope the vice chairman of Satan, and he says that it should be erect. It's also of interest that the obelisk at St. Peter's Basilica is placed at such a manner that as the sun rises in the east during the solstice, the shadow of the obelisk penetrates the middle of St. Peter's Basilica, symbolically penetrating, impenetrating this Vatican with the power of the sun. And I may have a picture of that. Well, here you see I, I, a picture of the, of the location. So looking straight down from the top of St. Peter's, um, you can see that there's a, an avenue. And that avenue is, is aligned direct east. So that when the summer solstice occurs, and you know the sun is rising in the east, the shadow, the sun comes down that avenue, and the shadow formed by the obelisk um, is directly over the middle of St. Peter's. And they say it is symbolically impregnating the Vatican with the power of the sun. Um, let's see if I... And interestingly, along, along this avenue, that avenue going back through there, it's hard to see. You can see them barely in the picture. But there is a, a series of small obelisks <laughs> representing, representing obelisks that, that line that whole street going up and down there. Um, I couldn't find my picture that I had of that. And I, that's just a picture of a picture. It's not very good quality. I'm sorry for that. Um, Again, this obelisk, it's a four-sided pillar. It represents the four corners of the earth. At its peak as a pyramid, it represents the combination of religious and political power throughout the world today. To the Jesuits, Masons, and the Illuminati, it stands for a one-world government. As we've noted, it is a phallic symbol. And as a point of interest, uh, Dr. Alberto Rivera, some of you may have heard of him, he claims to have been a former high-level Jesuit priest. He stated on 26th of the Chick publication, The Godfathers, that when the President of the United States took the oath of office facing an obelisk, I don't have that picture, I thought I did, sorry. Facing an obelisk, it would be a sign to the Jesuits worldwide that Protestantism is no longer a threat to the Vatican because of the ecumenical movement. And this was fulfilled in 1981 when uh, President Ronald Reagan was inaugurated um, facing or toward that, um, the obelisk of the Washington Monument. Now, the timing of that, I think, is important. That was in 1981. It was in 1981. And uh, just at the beginning of the year, basically. But what happened in the prior year, in 1980? Did a church that had once held to truth formally declare that we're not going to hold that truth anymore? Yes, they did, didn't they? Yes, they did. Because then, when 1980 was when the Seventh-day Adventist Church in General Conference session officially voted and approved the Trinity Doctrine. Over and over, God commanded his people to break down and tear down and beat down the images and idols that were in the land. In Isaiah 27, let's see. Here we go. Isaiah 27, verse 9. He says, By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sins, when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. And, uh, and there you see, I, I have put in the transliteration of a couple of the Hebrew words, the, the Ashereth and the Shaman, the images there. Uh, this Hebrew word for images is Asherah, which we've seen um, before, but the Hebrew word for images is Shaman. And uh, I can just, well, I don't know how much time I have here to, just a second. This is a long study, and I know we can't finish it right now, and I'm, we have so much more to do. But, but, but these, these images, let me just say this, these images, they were what Satan used to prepare the people for sun worship and for the worship of the Trinity. Okay? And yet this prophecy says that we're going to see sun pillars again in our, our day, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. Are there sun pillars on any, any Adventist churches today? Yeah, yeah. It's what we call a steeple today. A steeple is a sun pillar. That's what it is. You know, it's, it's, if you think about it, it's a funny thing. Why do churches put steeples on their roofs? Why would we do this? Why would we do this? If you, went, if you, if you could resurrect Peter or John and bring them into modern-day Christendom and show them these buildings, you know what they would say? Oh, 
that must be a place where they worship Baal because here's the sign of Baal. This is Baal worship. We say, no, no, this is a Christian church. Oh, no, this can't be a Christian church. This is where they worship Baal. That's what they would say. And God said that these things should be taken down. Now, I learned this when I was a young minister, and I was a minister in the Adventist church. And uh, I, I had just taken over a church that had just been built, just been built. And the people were so proud of their little sanctuary. I mean, it was beautifully decored. It was, it was sweet. It was humble, but it was elegant. And all the church building was beautiful. And on top of the church is this like 10-foot tall fiberglass obelisk. Well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to overlook this kind of stuff? As a minister, should I just say, well, you know, they didn't know better. I don't, I don't want to rock the boat. New church. Well, how dare I do th something like that? So we had a study. And a lot more than what we've went through here. There's a lot more I just haven't had a chance to go through. But, but I have here a pack of material for every family at least. There's probably not enough for everyone, but there's a pack for every family. And this is a pack of studies that I've published on the seal of God and the abominations of Ezekiel. And there's five different parts to it. We went through part one this morning. We're going through part of part two right now. Parts three, parts four, part five. And I've got one here for every one of you. If you don't get the magazine old pass, we have a pad on the back and a pen. You can put your name and address on it. And I'd be glad to send you our, our, our publication. It's free. There's no cost or obligation. But this will have the details of all the things I haven't had a chance to tell you. But we had a study at our little church at that time. And, uh, and I studied this. And I didn't say anything else about it, except we conveniently had a business meeting called for right after the study. <laughs> and um, I didn't have to say anything. They brought it to me. and said, why do we have this this thing on our church. I said, well, I don't know. What do you think about it? Well, we want to take it down. I said, well, you know, I, I didn't put it up there. It's not my call. I'm, I'm not the dictator here. If you all want to take it down, you can take it down. Well, we won't. We want to take it down. And the very person who had lobbied the hardest to get the steeple put on the church, who donated the most money to get the, the steeple on the church, was the first one who wanted it taken down. <laughs> and that person said, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just had no idea. And it was the first time I really got into big trouble with the conference. And the conference president called me and he said, why did you take that down? I said, well, do you, rep do you know it represents a male sexual organ in you know, stimulation? I'll just say it that way. And, oh yeah, but it, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. It's okay. And you know, it doesn't look like a church anymore. And I said, it looks like a church fine to me. I said, just a chapel. It's a building. We're the church. The people of the church, right? But God said repeatedly that these things should be broken down, taken down. And you say, well, you know, look, Brother Allen, there's no steeple in our church. Why do you even bring this up here today? No, there's not. And I'm glad there's not. But I want you to think about something, friends. If you knew what were the signs that pointed toward the coming of an enemy, even if those signs themselves didn't hurt you, would you want to know what they were so you could understand where you're at and how to apply things? I mean, I would. I certainly would. And so this helps us to understand that if we see these things today being enacted out in Adventism, we know that the other things, they're coming and they're going to be following. Um, I'm going to read to you uh, another statement, again, from Volume 5, page 208.3. And uh, let me just, I think I can scan ahead to it here. Maybe. Right here we are. It says, The prophet looking down the ages had this time presented before his vision. I think we read this earlier. But again, you know, we ask, how does this affect us today? We don't have obelisks in professed Christianity, of course. But steeples, as we study the history, were incorporated in the worship of Christ early. And if the apostles could be resurrected today, friends, I think that they would be appalled at what they seem. But remember the principle that Satan brings his symbols in first. And our acceptance to these matters, even though we ourselves may not be doing them, it prepares the way for further abominations, which I think are going to come a lot closer home than this. Furthermore, some people say that this is not a salvational issue because it's just a side issue to take our attention away from righteousness of Christ. It should not be studied. It's only useless, dangerous, and fanatical information. But may I remind you of this statement I bet you've not read lately. It's actually on the technical Physical page 65 of the book Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, but 
on the computer reference that references at 64.3. The paragraph continues over page 65. And there she says that the righteousness of Christ is pure, unadulterated truth. Think about that. We hear a lot of discussion about the righteousness of Jesus and righteousness by faith, and there's just about as many versions as there are preachers. But this simplifies things a lot. That the righteousness of Christ is pure, unadulterated truth. And if we don't have truth, we don't have the righteousness of Christ. But when we have truth, we have the righteousness of Christ. It's a very important issue. The importance of this is seen in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, where we have noted earlier that only those who sigh and cry over these abominations receive the seal of the living God. We're discussing truth that is essential for God's people at this time, and I'm going to read from my notes carefully because I want to finish quickly. I believe that some of our spiritual forefathers knew of these things. We're talking about what is essential for going to be a part of the 144,000 those who are sealed just before probation closes, those who have a seal and honor for the glory of God will not wish to be involved in anything that is disgusting to God. Ellen White tells us how God's people will sigh and cry in these matters, and we should notice this. And this is from volume 5, page 210, paragraph 3, and I've split it up into two slides. Again, this is from the Seal of God chapter. So you want to know, well, if I'm the sigh and cry over it, what does it mean? What does that mean? How do I practically apply that? She says, in the time when his wrath shall go forth in judgments, these humble, devoted followers of Christ will be distinguished from the rest of the world by their soul anguish, which is expressed in lamentation and weeping, reproofs and warnings, why others try to throw a cloak over the existing evils and excuse the great wickedness everywhere prevalent. Those who have a zeal for God's honor and love for souls will not hold their peace to obtain the favor of any. Their righteous souls are vexed day by day with the unholy works and conversation of the unrighteous. They are powerless to stop the rushing torrent of iniquity, and hence they are filled with grief and alarm. They mourn before God to see religion despised in the very homes of those who have had great light. They lament and afflict their souls because pride, avarice, selfishness, and deception of almost every kind are in the church. So friends, if you wish to be a part of the 144,000, you have to put the honor of God first. It's what's important. Nothing else is important. I'm not important. Church organization is not to be valued at that point, as important as it is. And by the way, I liked the way you started your worship service this morning, the call to worship. That was so nice. A orderly way of doing it. But friends, it is the honor of God that everything is to be directed toward. And if you felt a sigh and cry for those who are involved, you will not receive the seal of God. It's very plain, clear what the statement is saying. You will not be considered a part of the 144,000. But instead, if you do what the Bible tells, you will be considered a troubler of Israel. Do you remember Elijah? What did Ahab say to him when he saw him the second time? Are you he who troubleth Israel? He was a troubler of Israel. He said, no, I'm not been the troubler, but you and your fathers have. And that's what's being said today. They're saying, people like the little church Chino Valley, you're a troubler of Israel. But friends, the trouble of Israel is among those people. You may not receive the approval of the General Conference, but you can have the approbation of God. And I realize that this message will not be palatable to some, but I want to share with you a text from the uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. This is the New King James. I think it says it a little more clearly. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. King James says, who hold back. They suppress. In other words, there are people who know some of these things, but they won't dare say it. You know, because the bank account will, numbers will change. Really. The number of viewers on the television program will go down. The influence will be waning. How, have any of you ever heard of a preacher by the name of Bill Stringfellow? Bill Stringfellow? What a shame. Well, Bill was a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. He even wrote the Missionary Book of the Year one, one year. You, know, you remember the old Missionary Book of the Year? You used to get a Missionary Book of the Year if you were in Adventism a long time ago. You remember you used to always get one. They'd try to pass out a lot of them. And it was a book that was designed to teach all of our basic fundamental doctors. And he wrote the Missionary Book of the Year one year. And, uh, and it was called The Ultimate Ripoff. Ultimate Ripoff. And it was also later called All in the Name of the Lord. But, uh, but he later got into the independent ministry work. 
And he got to working with people like Bob Treves and uh, Gross Ball and some of those people that maybe you have heard of. I don't know if you've heard of some of those names. Um, but he'd been to a meeting in California one time, and he and his wife, Dee, were driving home. And uh, Dee was up front driving, and Bill was in the back laying down reading. He would do that a lot because, he, because unfortunately, Bill developed colon rectal cancer. It just wasn't always easy to sit down. So he's laying back there, and he'd gotten a pamphlet on this truth about God from someone at, at one of these meetings. And it was maybe a 40 or 50 page pamphlet, enough to give you a pretty good idea of what's going on. And he says, D, D, you, you've got to read this. This is truth. And so he started to preach the one true God. Made a whole series of videos. He made one, uh, a video called All in the Name of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, it was called The Red Flag is Waving. The Red Flag is Waving. And uh, how there was a red flag. This should be a red flag to us, these things we're seeing and hearing. He made a whole series of videos. And, um, and, and blessed a lot of people. Blessed a lot of people. But there came a day when the cancer got the better of Bill and he died. He died. One of the last things he did was to, to, to make another series of videos on the truth about God. And, and he, would, uh, he and his wife would work on these videos in their home. He would maybe shoot 10 minutes of video and he'd lay down on the, on the floor and just cry and try to rest to get the strength to shoot 10 more minutes. He was just so dedicated to the work. And when he died, I was asked by his wife to conduct the funeral service in Little Spencer, Tennessee, near where they lived at the time. There was his immediate children, his family there. My family was there. Two other families was there that knew him and one neighbor. And I told those people, if this man had died five years ago, you couldn't have parked all the cars in Spencer, Tennessee of the people who would have come and wanted to have come to honor this man and his memory. He was so well loved and known in that historic Adventist movement, as you might call it at that time. But when he accepted the truth about God, he got dropped like the hottest potato from everybody's affections and love and support that you can imagine. And when he was dying in his last days, he did not get even one single get well, thinking of you, praying for you card from these guys that he'd worked with shoulder to shoulder for years. It was irrehensible to me. But you see, Bill had accepted the message of Romans 118. He was not going to suppress or hold back the truth for anyone or for anything. And I cannot and will not suppress the truth either because it's unpopular. But now the question is, what will you do? What will you do? We'll take questions this afternoon because I know we're already past our probably a lot of time now. But if you have questions, we'll be glad to take them all. But I want to look at some of these other abominations this afternoon, particularly the third and fourth one. We probably have time to cover those, maybe not the second one too. But the papers have the studies on, you can get them. But I want you to understand, friends, that all this helps us to gain a better picture of where we're at in the stream of time and the progression in the way that Satan is working and what he's bringing in and what we can expect to see very soon. May God have mercy upon Israel.